If you're a retail investor and you walk into a bank with, say, $10,000, they will ask you a bunch of questions first, like, how old are you? What is your annual income? And based on all those responses, they will draw up a risk profile on you and come up with a recommendation that sounds something like this. 30% domestic stocks, 4% international stocks, and then 30% in bonds that are divided into long-term and short-term bonds. Now, from the bank's perspective, it makes a lot of sense because they can put you in a box of who you are and start collecting a fee for managing your money. But for you as an investor, you might feel it's tailor-made, but if you dig more into the recommendation of the bank, it might not make as much sense because the asset allocation typically has very little to do with the current yield of the asset classes. It's determined more on a flawed mindset that caters to your emotions as a consumer and not so much as an investor. Please allow me to elaborate. If you have a low risk profile, again, in the eyes of the bank, say that you are close to retirement, they would likely say that you should buy close to no stocks. But what if stocks are cheap? If they're extremely cheap, why not buy stocks? And if bonds then are expensive with yields around 0%, nothing's really more risky if you're close to retirement than to own long-term bonds if you want to preserve your wealth. Today, you can get close to 3 3.5% on a 30-year federal bond. Very, very low rates historically. If the interest rate went up by just 1% after you bought the bond, you would lose 17% of your investment. Still, you hear banks saying that you should buy long-term bonds for the sake of buying a bond, really, and having that 30% allocation in your portfolio, for instance. Another thing I would like to point out is that you always hear that you should allocate domestic stocks or domestic bonds. And the reason for this is more emotional. You know, it makes us feel good to buy something that's domestic, something we feel we know something about. But that's not the same as saying that is really where the best returns are. So please allow me to give you an example here. If you live in Ireland, I can almost guarantee that your bank will tell you to buy domestic stock. But the Irish stock market is the most expensive in the world priced to 2.5% expected return. Whereas if you live in the Czech Republic, you would get closer to 10%. But banks in both countries would likely tell you to buy a domestic stock. The US in comparison is also pretty expensive right now, close to a 3% expected return. I'll make sure to post links in the notes for the video to show you where I get the numbers from. Now, there's something to be said about having both stocks and bonds. Typically, they do act in opposite directions, which investors typically like because it gives less volatility. When rates go down, the stock market typically go up because the risk-free rate is now lower and it's relatively more attractive to buy stocks and companies have cheaper debt financing. If we look across the board, stocks and bonds in more developed countries are priced similar to each other, but with very different risk profile. So before we talk about the current market conditions, my message is really this, learn how to value the asset classes and then determine how much exposure you would like to have. For the next video in this course series about looking at your portfolio, I would like to talk more about how do you estimate the intrinsic value of a stock. I would like to take a specific stock, Southwest Airlines, but it could basically be any other stock. When it comes to short-term bonds, it's similar to value in many ways. At the time I'm doing this video, you can get 2.3% from holding a two-year bond. So that is also the expected return. You are close to no interest risk because the bonds run out in just, well, two years. For the long-term bonds, it's slightly more complicated because it depends on what's going to happen with the interest rate. So if you have a bond and it's priced at 2.3 or a longer bond that's priced at, say, 3%, it's different. And I'll make sure to have a link here in the video show notes where you can also make your calculations. But for now, just remember if it's short term, you can be more sure of the expected return. Whereas if it's long term, you really have to protect your principal. So if we talk about the current market conditions, if you buy the stock market overall, the expected returns are pretty meager. You can't expect higher returns on individual stocks. Again, assuming that you know how to pick the right individual stocks, but the short-term effects are likely going to be the same. 
if and when the stock market crash, you will see the same thing happening to your stocks. The yield you can get on long-term bonds are really low. If you deduct inflation and taxes, you end up around 0%. The taxation around bonds, again, depending on where you live, you're typically taxed every year, whereas you are not so with stocks. The lower yield you can get with short-term bonds are not overly attractive. But if you can keep up with inflation, it's one thing that's good. And you don't have that interest rate risk, which we talked about before, which gives you access to funds when you invest in asset classes that suddenly has a more attractive valuation. Also, if you're an income investor, I will not look at bonds right now, but rather at a basket of dividend stocks with a wide moat and little debt. I would cross-check what happened in 2008 and see if they made more money during the crisis and perhaps even increased dividend despite the company's stock price being, say, cut in half. Another thing I'd like to talk about is how many securities should you have and what should the position size be? The short answer is, I don't know specifically for you. There are as many ways to construct a portfolio as there are investors. And that's also why it's not always a good idea to ask your bank and get that standardized, the 40, 30, 20, 10% allocation or whatever they're going to tell you. Instead, let's have some context to this discussion. So if we talk about the number of, say, stocks, if we look away from ETF investing, which is different, and you focus on individual stock picks instead, I would suggest that you have between 10 to 20 stocks. At least with more than 20 stocks, the extra gain of owning additional stocks is almost non-existing. Or said in another way, if you buy more than 20 stocks, you will likely pay more in commissions and trading expenses than you gain from diversification. But I'll also say that if you buy the biggest and most diversified ETFs, you would typically not need more than two to three to be well diversified. Now, so let's revert back to the discussion here on individual stock picks. Now, if you do pick stock one by one, you really need to understand the nuts and bolts to do this. And the issue about owning more than 20 stocks is that you will likely have a watch list too. So it will take a lot of your time and you either have to do this for a living or you might doing this on the side and just feel overwhelmed with the 20 stocks that you own and you know, the other 50 stocks that you have on your watch list. Regardless, I wouldn't suggest to have more than 10% of my portfolio in the same stock. We must always be respectful of the possibility of being wrong. And I'm as guilty as charged. At one point in time, I had 27% of my position in National Oil Vago. I did my research and plowed through all the financial reports. I really couldn't see how I was wrong and therefore also made a really sizable bet. Then the price of oil dropped and I sold out with a button out almost 50% lower than what I bought it at. And I can tell you 10 reasons why I was right easily. But the bottom line is I was wrong. And everyone is wrong from time to time. Though the best investors are not as often wrong as I am, we can all be wrong. So I would never suggest anyone to put more than 10% in the same stock. And even if you feel more comfortable with just 5%, then that should be your limit. And let's briefly touch upon the concept of volatility. Generally, investors shy away from volatility, which is also why it's such a good sales argument when you hear someone say you should own the index, you know, 500 different stocks. If you do that, again, which is perfectly fine, you own the market regarding volatility. In other words, if the market crashes 30%, you will lose something to that effect. If it goes up, so will the stocks. But in the long run, your stocks will, of course, perform accordingly to your skill as a stock picker. As a value investor, I feel that volatility is underappreciated. I more see it as an opportunity to buy low and sell high. Of course, none of us likes to lose money, but if your stock depreciates in price and the intrinsic value stays the same, which sometimes is the case, Use it as an opportunity to buy more or celebrate if the company is buying back stock. However, a lot of investors do not feel the same way and choose a different approach. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a portfolio that minimizes the volatility. As long as you're well aware how that changes the expected return and downside of your strategy.
you shouldn't be using the stock market returns as your benchmark of your performance if your goal and risk profile is just very, very different. Perhaps your goal is to minimize volatility, and then that's what you should do. The famous value investor, Sanji Bakshi, has multiple times stated the argument for having stress-adjusted returns. Basically, it's a way of saying, how do you get the highest expected return in the stock market with the least amount of stress? Many investors find that individual stock picking is not for them and choose an ETF strategy, aiming at indexes and spending as little time as possible on their investments. I personally love the idea of stress-adjusted returns. If you feel you can achieve that the best way, buying ETFs, then that's what you should do. I hope this very first lesson on asset allocation has shed light on what you're missing, but also what you're gaining depending on your approach. And I wish you the best of luck building your portfolio.